Hi, Jim. Thank you very much for joining us today. Well, I'm delighted to be here, Jimmy. Uh, I haven't been to Toronto in a long time. I used to love it there. Jim, I want to start with your backstory. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? And how did you make it to Wall Street? Well, I grew up in a small uh, town in the backwoods of Alabama, a uh, place called Demopolis, Alabama. It was pretty, my phone number was five, Jimmy, just to show you, uh, it was far in the backwoods of Alabama. Uh, and I had a wonderful time there, very small place. Uh, I then went to Yale University. I, I had a scholarship quite by chance to go to Yale, uh, where I'd had another wonderful time. And I got a scholarship to go to Oxford University in England. So I went there uh, and had a wonderful time and finally got to Wall Street after the U.S. Army. Well, Jim, the good thing about having a single digit phone number is that it was easy to remember. Yes, yes, yes. No, well, I think that's how I got into Yale, by the way. When I, my application said phone number, I put five. They never had anybody with a phone number five apply. So I think that's what, what probably got me into fancy schools. And Jim, I'm curious, why did you decide on going to Yale University and why not the University of Alabama? Well, it, it was really an accident. I was at a, a boys club, a, a international boys club called the Key Club. And for some reason in those days, Yale gave a scholarship to a member of the Key Club. Uh, I didn't know anything about Yale. I knew absolutely nothing. I only applied to two universities, one of which was Yale. And lo and behold, I got the scholarship. It was a shock. Still is a shock. Uh, I think it was part of Yale's effort to get get people from like me from places like that. Uh, but what, for whatever reason, I got the scholarship and boy, was I scared, but I went. And do you think going to an Ivy League school gave you an edge? Well, uh, it gives one uh, certainly a sense of confidence that I might not have had otherwise. I mean, being being on Wall Street and in New York, if I had been to a lesser known university, I, I would have had e even more of an ax against me, a strikes against me. Uh, so it certainly gave me some confidence that I that maybe was unjust and certainly not justified, but it did give me some confidence that I probably would not have had otherwise. And where did you meet George Soros? Oh, well, I, that was he was he needed a young man to work for him, uh, a young person, and I needed a job. And somebody introduced us, and you know the rest of the story. Jim, you and George Soros founded the Quantum Fund, and during that time, the fund was up uh, 4,200% over a 10 year period. How did you achieve such remarkable returns? Well, we both loved what we were doing, and uh, I certainly was wildly passionate about the, the investment world and spent all of my time doing it. And we kept finding things that were ignored. You may remember the markets were pretty horrible in the 70s. So that did mean there were cheap things. Uh, but just because they were cheap didn't mean they had to go up. But for whatever reason, and we invested all over the world, which very few people did in those days. And we sold short, which not many people did in those days. And we used a lot of leverage. Uh, so. I guess passion, diversity, or, or international uh, skepticism, it worked. And do you think if you and George were starting out or starting the fund today, you could achieve the same sort of success? I'm too lazy. <laughs> no. <laughs> and and I'm, I suspect see, Soros is 90 years old, so probably not. Well, I meant to say that if you were both starting out in business again. Oh, well, I don't know if, if, if I could, but I certainly know that it can be done. Uh, you know, you can look around the world and you see that there are always some markets going up a lot and some going down a lot. And if you have somebody who is energetic and smart enough to find them, to find opportunities, sure, there are plenty of opportunities. You just have to find them. Jim, I know you have always had an opinion on gold. What's your opinion now? Well, I own gold uh, and silver. I, I didn't buy, I stopped buying in 2010 or so, and then I started buying again last summer, and I will be buying more gold and silver. You know, before this is over, gold and silver are going to go up a lot uh, because throughout history, 
when people lose confidence in governments or money, uh, they always buy gold and silver. I mean, you know, whether we like it or not. Politicians and academics will tell you that it's absurd. Don't buy gold and silver. Well, Jimmy, I'm an old peasant. All of us peasants know we don't listen to, to politicians and, and academics. We know that gold and silver have always been good when things get really bad. So I, I'm, a, I'm an old peasant and I own gold and silver and I will buy more. And do you only buy the commodity or do you also buy gold producers? Occasionally I invest in gold miners. I don't think I, I don't own any right now. If I do, I can't remember it. Uh, I, no, what? No, I, I, I try to find opportunities wherever they exist. And Jim, we can't have a discussion on gold without talking about the U.S. dollar. What's your view on the U.S. dollar? Well, I own a lot of U.S. dollars, Jimmy, because uh, throughout history, when, when there's turmoil, people look for a safe haven. And for historic reasons, people think the U.S. dollar is a safe haven. It's not. It's not. The U.S. is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. But people think it's safe, and compared to the euro or sterling or other things, people will buy the dollar. Uh, it's, it's having a correction right now, uh, which is which is normal, I, I think, I hope. Uh, so I, I suspect that when the crisis gets bad again in a year or two, the US dollar will be very strong. It will probably get overpriced, might turn into a bubble. I hope I'm smart enough to sell if it does. And Jim, we can't have a discussion on gold without discussing Bitcoin. It had a huge 2023 up over 160%. And I'm assuming you don't trade it, but I still want to get your views on it. Well, yes, I do have a view. Uh, obviously, it's been a great trading vehicle for some people in the last uh, few years, not many years, few years. Um, I don't own any cryptocurrency. Several of them have already disappeared, as you know. Dozens of them have already come and gone. Uh, in my view, that was what will happen too. Well, first of all, Jimmy, we must uh, establish that money is going to be on the computer. It's all, already in China. You cannot take a taxi in China with cash. You have to have your money on your computer. You know, you, you give them your phone if you want to take a taxi or buy an ice cream or anything else. So it's already happening. Some countries are ahead of North America, such as China. Uh, so that's happening and governments love it. Nearly all governments are now working on computer money, as, as I'm sure you know, including the US. We're all working on it. Governments love it. It's You don't have to print. It's cheap. You don't have to print it. You don't have to transport it. You don't have to secure it. You don't have to account for it. And they can know everything about you. They will call you one day, Jimmy, and say, Jimmy, you've had too much coffee this month. Cut back on you. And they'll know everything you do. And they love that. Well, I hate it, of course, but they love it. And so computer money is coming uh, if other currencies become successful, the governments will outlaw them. They always have. You know, governments don't like competition when it comes to money. 100 years ago, 80 years ago, you could use anything you wanted as money. Banks could print their own money legally, and they did. But then the Bank of England in the 30s said, uh, starting next week, if you use anything for money except our money, pound sterling, it's an act of treason. Well, treason means they execute you. So people stop using competing money, competing currencies, and that will happen again. Now, Jimmy, the crypto guys say, listen, we're smarter than the government. And they certainly are. I mean, everybody's smarter than the government. But the government has the guns, you know. And, and as in the 30s, if they make it an act of treason, most people will stop using competing currencies. And that will happen again. Do I like it? No. Will it happen? Yes. Jim, when you look at the current situation, the current economic and political situation, does this time period remind you of a Another time period in the financial markets? Uh, well, as I said before, I've seen bubbles before. Uh, and so, yes, I can see bubbles developing, not just in the U.S., but in other, other places as well. And in certain industries, I, I, again, they always look the same. Always, always, <coughs> always the same. Stocks go up every day. 
everybody cannot get enough of whatever the group is, whatever the stocks are. So yes, that has happened before. Uh, there has never been a time that I know of in world history where there's been so much leverage in the system. You know, in 2008, we had a problem because of too much debt, but Jimmy, since then, the debt has skyrocketed everywhere. Everywhere, debt has skyrocketed. So I have never read about a period in world history when there was such staggering amounts of debt at every level. Uh, so yes, history repeats itself, or at least it rhymes, but you know, I don't, I don't remember ever seeing such huge amounts of debt worldwide. Uh, bubbles I've seen, this amount of debt has never existed before. Jim, you were featured in Jack Schwager's book, Market Wizards, and I want to get your views on what makes a successful trader or a successful investor. Everybody has their own style. You know, uh, I knew, I've known guys who were fabulous short-term traders. I mean, they could, I don't know how they do it, you know, without even looking at the, well, they don't have tapes anymore, but they could just know, they would sense things that they should buy. I mean, often they would sell them a day later, a week later, or an hour later. Uh, I'm terrible at that. I'm very, very bad at that. Whatever success I've had, and I had to learn this the hard way, I guess most of us have to learn the hard way. Uh, I try to find things that are ignored, therefore cheap. But if I can find something that's cheap, where there's a positive change taking place, sometimes I have a success. And conversely, if you can find things that are wildly overpriced and can, where there's a change taking place and you can sell them short, you might have a success as well. And Jim, being a very active trader, I'm sure you've executed many trades over your career. Are there any trades that stand out for whatever reason, either because you made a lot of money or you lost a lot of money? Oh, sure. Um, probably the... You know, my, my failures are the, are, the, are the ones I remember the most. Uh, anybody can remember their successes. Um, I remember at one point I, I shorted the market when nobody, I bought, uh, I, I, sh I actually bought puts on the market at a time when I was the only skeptic around. And lo and behold, five months later, I had tripled my money. I thought I was so smart. I thought I was going to be rich any day. I actually reverse my position the day the market hit bottom i knew i was smart then well two months later i started selling short and two months after that i was wiped out lost everything I, there was a lot i didn't know about the world a lot i didn't know about markets a lot i didn't know about myself jim i'm curious why did you move to singapore why not hong kong or beijing or kuala lumpur uh well, I, I wanted my children to speak Mandarin. Uh, KL, they wouldn't be, Kuala Lumpur, they would, it would be difficult for them to really speak good Mandarin. Uh, the Chinese cities are too polluted. We try Chinese cities, but they all were and are all filthy. So Singapore, you know, they speak English and they speak Mandarin in Singapore, and it's a very efficient and clean place to live. Great education, great healthcare, great everything. Jim, what are your thoughts on the trade tensions between China and the U.S.? The first answer is it's absurd. Uh, anybody who knows history knows that trade wars, trade tensions have never worked. The things that work are when you open up and you get more and more prosperous together. I mean, history is pretty clear about that. Unfortunately, the people in Washington don't seem to understand history or, or they think they're smarter than history. Let's put it that way. Even if they know history, they think that they're smarter than history and that they can win trade wars. History is very, very clear. Trade wars have never been good for anybody, but history is also clear that when things start going wrong, politicians always blame foreigners. It's very easy to blame the foreigners, uh, and it's always happened all over the world throughout history. Foreigners have different skin, different eyes, different hair, different language, different religion, different food, different dress. It's very, they always blame foreigners, and both the Democrats and the Republicans in America have said, well, we've got an election in November. We're going to win the election by blaming the Chinese and foreigners. Is it good? 
It's not good for America, it's not good for China, it's not good for the world, but it's always happened. Jim, are you still passionate about the financial markets? Do you still spend a good deal of your day reading about the financial markets? Well, I certainly do, whether I like it or not. Uh, you know, it's, it's part of my soul now. Uh, and as you well know, if you understand, you have to understand the financial markets to understand what's going on in the world. I mean, if you see things happening in, in Pakistan, it affects the financial markets not just in Pakistan, but in other countries as well and in other areas. I mean, Pakistan's a huge producer of cotton, for instance. So, I mean, these things, whether I like it or not, uh, because of my background and my history, I cannot avoid uh, the financial markets. Jim, what advice would you give a young person on investing? I would give the same advice to everybody. Only invest in what you yourself know a lot about. Uh, don't listen to the TV, or don't listen to me, don't listen to the internet. Just stay with what you know. Everybody knows a lot about something, whether it's fashion or cars or something. So stay with what you know. Uh, if I told you you can only have 25 investments in your life, you would be very careful about what you invested in and you would probably be very successful. You're gonna see a change long before I am because it's your passion. Every day you go on the internet and look at fashion or whatever. So when you see something changing, do your research and make an investment and then call me. And, and by the way, you'll also know when it's gonna change for the worse before everybody else because you know more about it than most other people. Now, Jimmy, nobody wants to hear that. Everybody wants a hot tip. That's boring, boring. <laughs> but if you want to be successful, be boring. And you'll, unless you're a short-term trader, and as I said before, there's some people who are great at that. Unless you're a short-term day-to-day or hour-to-hour trader, just stay with what you know. If you could have a second career or something totally outside of investing, what would it be? Well, it would depend on, on what I love. I guess I'd be a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't worry, that's that's a joke. I'm I'm tone deaf, you know. I can't even, I can't even carry a tune, so I wouldn't be a very good rock star. Chances are pretty slim. Or a baseball player, or basketball player. Uh, who knows? Uh, let's see. I don't know. When I was a child, I always thought I was going to be an actor someday. Uh, but Wall Street was much more fascinating for me. Jim, you have had an incredible life. You've traveled around the world, not once, but twice. You went to Woodstock. I love that story, by the way. What do you see as your greatest achievement? What are you most proud of? Woodstock, <laughs> of course. <laughs> I was on the stage. You know, I crawled up on the stage and was a volunteer security guy for Woodstock. Uh, I don't know, probably my daughters. I would say, yes, I would, not probably, specifically and clearly my my two daughters. Uh, that's the best thing I've ever done. And I, I hope that in 30 years, I can still say that. And do you wish you had your daughters earlier in life? Well, probably not. I'm not sure, if I'd had children when I was 20 or 30, uh, it would not have been good for the mother or the children or me, because you know there were too many other things I desperately wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to go around the world. I wanted to make some money. Uh, there were other things I wanted to do. So uh, it probably would not have been good. Uh, I had my first child when I was 60. So by then, and even then I was skeptical. Even then I, I wasn't sure I wanted to do it. Uh, but now I, I know it was a great thing to do. Uh, I, it would not, you know, I, the second time I went around the world, I was 57 or so. So. You know, it was still a lot I had to do uh, to get out of my system, and now I've done it. Well, Jim, that was a fascinating discussion, and I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today, and I hope the next time we get together, we can do it in person. Well, thank you, Jimmy. It's been fun. Let's do it again sometime.